Welcome once again to Pale Blooms and Beyond. Thank you for joining us today. Christopher John Trevor Midgley, AKA Bo, is a British singer, songwriter, and 12 string guitar player. The majority of his work has been in the folk genre. To call him a pro prolific songwriter is putting it mildly. Trevor has recorded as Bo, John Trevor, Trevor Midgley, and Symphonica. He was one of the first to be signed and re record on John Peel's fledgling Dandelion Records back in 1969. To date, there have been some 30 to 31 albums under the aforementioned monikers on various record labels, plus songs included in another 30-odd compilation album. And Mr. Midgley shows no signs of slowing down. In fact, as he has said, more recent production during his 60s and 70s has dwarfed the output of material during his 20s. With such a massive collection, I decided to focus primarily on Trevor's earlier years, mainly the dandelion recording. Well, welcome, Trevor. Thank you very much, Greg. Good to be with you. Thank you for joining me. So let's go back quite a few years uh, to the origins. Uh, you were born in Leeds, correct? Correct. Yes, absolutely. 76 years ago. All right. Um, I must say in reading your website, you have a very vivid recollection of your childhood, unlike most folks. Uh, talk about a little of your uh, fondest memories of, of growing up. Yeah, you're right, I do. Um, my earliest musical memories, I guess, go back and when I was about four or five. Um, yeah, it would be about four or five. And it, the, the very earliest musical memory I've got, and music's always been particularly important. Um, I went with my mother and my grandmother to stay with my grandmother's sister in uh, Coventry in the Midlands here. And I remember that her husband had a record player phonograph and on it, there was this tune that kept going and playing and playing and playing, going round and round in my head. I know now that it was Elgar's Pomp and Circumstance number four, but I didn't know that at the time. All I knew is that I loved this piece of music and I sort of marched around this old kitchen and it stuck with me and it stuck with me. And that was the first time that I, I actually remember really being interested in, and really catching music. And it sort of it sort of went on went on from there. I mean, I had a I had a very nice childhood, a very good childhood, a very stable childhood. It wasn't a musical childhood because the weird thing was that my parents, no way were they in any way musical. The family isn't musical at all. Uh, I had an aunt who hammered, and that's being kind, hammered on the piano, but nothing else, and that was entirely by ear. Uh, old auntie Jess, but she was the only one, and. My mother and father, they could, they could never see that. They loved ballroom dancing, loved ballroom dancing. So they loved Joe Lost, they loved Glenn Miller, they, they, they loved all of, the, all of the, the ballroom dancing bands. And that was, that was it. And when we were at home, we were never sort of listening to music. We weren't listening to a light program. We didn't have a, a record player or a, a gramophone phonograph. We didn't have one. And yet I knew that music was something that meant a lot to me. And I can't really explain why, except it started with that, that thing in Coventry with the, with the Elgar. And that's, that's sort of how it began. And the music always, always, always interested me whenever I could get to hear it, then I did. But we didn't have any kit ourselves at home, just the radio. Can you remember um, one of the first uh, singles or albums that someone got for you or that you you purchased? Uh, yeah, yeah, but it goes back before that. Um, when I was about, oh, what would I be, seven or eight maybe? Yeah, so I'm talking about maybe at 1950, 54. Um, I do remember that my mother took me to the Empire Theatre in Leeds and there was a guy on by the name of Lee Lawrence. Lee Lawrence. I, guess, you know, I don't know whether he's known in the States, but he's reasonably well known here. And I don't know why she took me. He was dire. He was absolutely appalling. And I, I, I remembered, even as a little kid, I was, I was pathetically bored. And yet, 
I still loved music. I just knew it wasn't that. And that's a very early memory of going, of going to the theater. But then we move forward, one thing, that would be about 54. Go forward two years, go forward three years. And we were at, um, my folks and myself, we were at somebody's uh, house on a Christmas Eve. And I was sort of parked away at the side of the side room with the two daughters whilst the adults did their thing. And these, these girls had got uh, Elvis's Jailhouse Rock EP. Mm. Mm. and they put that on. Now, I'd heard Elvis um, very, very little, because like I say, we didn't listen to much um, music on the radio. It was mostly home service serious stuff. But I had heard Elvis. I'd heard um, Heartbreak Hotel like that. But when I heard Jailhouse Rock, it just blew me. Mm -hmm. It was, it were, I, I, I can't actually genuinely describe how important that was. And we, I, I mean, it was the EP, there was five tracks on the EP. Oh, and that, that track, that, the EP, but the track itself, we must have played a dozen times that night. And I was just played again, played again, played again. And, and I have to say, I can sort of add on to that. Oh God, what, 50 years? 50 years on from that, I was in, uh, I was in Arlington, Texas, um, at the uh, Four Nationals Guitar Show. And uh, I had a very, very fortunate meeting with Scotty Moore. Um, and Scotty Moore, I mean, there's a lovely bloke, obviously, sadly died now, but I uh, had a long, long conversation with him. And I was, I, was, I was able to say to him, you know, just what that had meant, because that launched my, my, my real musical interest. The, 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 that was the thing that really kept me going, that started things off. And from there, everything went. But it was those opening chords at Jailhouse Rock, played by Scotty Moore, and I was at least able to say to him, thank you for that. And for the fellow that you were back in as well. <laughs> exactly. And that was, I mean, I, I, I cannot, from my own point of view, I cannot overstate how important that moment was for me musically. Jailhouse Rock, the Christmas actually, 50, 57 it would be actually, Christmas of 57. Oh. Yeah, it was, it was so radical for that time. You know, it, it was... Uh, that 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 kind of music. I mean, yeah, like you know, it was like it just came out of you know where did it come out of nowhere? You know? It was. I mean, it was it, it was absolutely marvelous. I mean, the, the difficulty is that what well, I said. The difficulty, like I said, we didn't have a a record player. We didn't have a radiogram. We didn't phonograph or anything. Um, and it wasn't until 1960 um, that, upon my nattering, and what would I be at that time? 14. Uh, nattering the folks that we did actually get, uh, I got, uh, a record player, which then I could start buying records, buying singles and uh, the whole shebang. But up to that point, never actually had that sort of musical facility in the house. And it seems a bit strange, but I, if I was going to listen to anything, it was going to other people's houses, listening to their, listening to their records and everything else. That's all. But I didn't have it myself until 14. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And yeah, I was playing the guitar before that, funnily enough. There you go. <laughs> All right. Well, um, in in school, uh, what, uh, what 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 uh, studies did you did you enjoy, or did you enjoy uh, school? In? Um, yeah, <laughs> in the early, in the early days of school, I I did. For, you know, funnily enough, the one the one subject I ever got a hundred percent in, and this is absolutely true, I got a hundred percent in a Latin exam. Is that right? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's the only thing. I mean, it wasn't sort of, it wasn't studying uh, the Iliad or Aeneas' adventures or anything like that. But I did get 100%. So I've always been quite proud of that. But at school, my, my best subjects were uh, maths and physics. Um, and, and maths and physics and English language, actually. Those, those three were my, my sort of key interests. And they were, they were the ones that sort of floated my boat quite a bit. Um, and funnily enough, and when, when, when we go much, much later into computing, um, that interest in mathematics and, and sort of the, the, some of the logics and the rationale um, with maths, although I'm, I'm not a computer tech, and I'm reasonable with it, but that stood me in quite good stead, just simply that interest, uh, because that's always been there. I, like, I sort of like the, the, the logic of things, and that you can apply, of course, in computing. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, early on when you learn some of these... Um... You know, you take some of these courses, you think, am I ever going to use that? Oh, yeah. And then, yeah. And then 
Yeah, that's good. It's, but I mean, that's, in fairness, I mean, that's what a good a good education is like. I mean, I know, you know, you go to school, you have to do the physical education, you do the religious studies, you do the English lang, you do mass geography and everything else. You don't know what you're going to need. But the idea being, of course, at least if you get a general education, then at least you can sort out what it is that's going to mean something to you. If, you, if, you're, if you're more restricted than that, or don't get any, you never get those opportunities. So I was very fortunate, actually. I, I, I was actually very fortunate because I went, I went to Leeds Grammar School, which is, um, I didn't realize it actually at the time, but it, it was, uh, it's a minor public school. Public school here means private school. With you, public school means public school. <laughs> but but it, it, was, it was actually a really good school. And although, in fairness, I became a tad rebellious uh, once I got into my teens, okay. it did give me a good a good basic education for which I'm grateful to this day. <clears throat> well, um, at, at what age uh, did your uh, schoolmaster begin calling you Bo? Oh, oh yeah, Howard Brown. Yeah, yeah. The, no, the, the, I was fat. I mean, I was, I was a fat kid. Well, okay, go back a, a little bit. My grandfather on my father's side, I mean, he was, the, the, the Midgley's are fat. We are big. <laughs> and and it, it, it's not hormonal, it's gluttony, it's as simple as that. But um, my grandfather, Walt, he, he, he was 22 stone, and when he, when he died, he was, um, what's that in pounds? I've no idea, I can't remember. But he was big, 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 big. And my father was quite, quite reasonably large. And so I was as well. And my mother sort of doted on me, rather, because I was the only child. And I'd been, I was born nine months and three days after my father came out of the Air Force, after the Second World War. Is that right? So my folks were actually relatively quite old. I was the only child. And my mother absolutely doted upon me and fed me all of the stuff that they hadn't been able to eat during the war. So I was stuffed with sugar, butter, fat, you name it, and up I went. So when I get to the grammar school, uh, things like, uh, what shall we say, uh, running, um, rugby, football, no, 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 that wasn't me at all, because one of the great things, sorry, I'm sort of going off a slight angle. When I was a kid, I couldn't run 100 yards without being out of breath. I can't run 100 yards now without being out of breath, so I'm no worse off than I was then, which is, you know, not bad 70 years on. But the thing being, when I got into this, this, particular class there were two midgeleys me the fat one and a lad whose name was actually david but everybody called herb that was how it was in british schools you just called people what you wanted we were just i was midgeley that was all but of course there were two midgeleys and so howard brown who was the the french master concern tried to differentiate between us so he called him midgeley but he called me sarcastically i've always thought Bo, because i wasn't i was actually quite voluminous well i wasn't good looking <laughs> i was awful so that i mean that was how the bow thing came about because there were two midgets in the same form and that was it stuck and everybody everybody then called me Bo, and i was i've been, I've been called Bo all the way through now for what i we saying 65 years but the difficulty is when i when i sort of took that name professionally there were no bows in England. I mean, bow is a totally uncommon name in England. Right. Yeah. Come to the States, of course, and there's ten a penny. Yeah. Big deal. So that made things a little bit tricky when it came to doing anything to do with the States. But there you are, we live with these things. <laughs> right. <So. laughs> yeah, I like to hear those background stories like that. <laughs> um, what about as, as a teen? Uh, what were some of the uh, the artists and musicians that you were really into? Oh, um, well, I've mentioned Elvis. Elvis, obviously. Um, Dwayne Eddy. The, uh, what, what were known over here as the great Americans, actually. Yeah, so you're talking Elvis, Dwayne Eddy, uh, Eddie Cochran, um, people like that. Over this side of the pond, we had uh, the Shadows, who came became very popular starting in 1960, thing called Apache. Um, Cliff Richard... Mm, a very weak man's version of Elvis, very weak. Um, but primarily, it was it was you know in, in quotes the great Americans that 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 sort of got me. I saw uh, Dwayne Dwayne Eddy came over. I saw him on a, several occasions. Uh, Elvis obviously never made it out, mainly because Colonel Parker would have never got back into the states if he tried. 
<laughs> so, but I mean, those were those were the prime drivers for me. But then, of course, later on, when you suddenly hit 1962, which in this well, in this country in October 1962, and of course uh, the fallout from Liverpool, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden the world changed when uh, when those lads, when the Beatles came out. Oh yeah, yeah. Speaking of Elvis, did you see the movie? Did you watch the movie? I haven't seen it yet. Okay, yeah, yeah. I, I haven't seen it. Yet. I just wonder if uh, uh, Tom Hanks's accent was really strange in that, but maybe it was it was close to Colonel Parker, the you know his actual accent. I don't because I never heard heard him spoke, speak really. No, I never did either. But he was. I mean, oh, he's. Uh, he was from uh, Holland, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. He was, he was an illegal immigrant, and, and yeah. illegal immigrant. Sure, but he sure. was. Um, oh, he's a. I mean, he, in the early days, I think he did very well for Elvis. But after that, it became uh, he, he became more of a drag on what Elvis could have been. But there you are. That's the way it went. Yeah, watch that and see if um, you think it might be pretty accurate. I don't. Yeah, know. yeah, yeah. I will. I will. If do. You get it. Yeah, if you get it. Um, what about the? Uh, you, you mentioned seeing Dwayne Eddy. Mm -hmm. uh, what What were earlier concerts that you attended? Do you re recall that? Um. Well, I mean, we, if we're talking Dwayne Eddy, of course, we are talking sometime around 1959, 1960, 1961. So I was only 14, 15 then. But I mean, there, there were the usual. We had package. Did you have? You did have package tours over there, didn't you? You know, where whole bunches of artists are going. Oh, of course, the Buddy Holly and Richie Valens thing, films. Um, but we had loads of those. So I mean, again, in many cases, it was Americans coming over here. So do you remember Jimmy Jones, a thing called Handyman and, and yeah. uh, Good Timing? He was on. Uh, he was on one of the package tours that I saw. Um, again, just going around the around the country here. So, right. but broadly speak, broadly speaking, Greg, it, it was mostly Americans, mostly the Americans. Okay, okay, okay. And uh, what was it that, that with those, you know, package tours? They each performer could only do what three or four songs or something. Yeah, like that. and then you, you you usually have one of the sort of one of the name guys would finish the first half. And then the name guy would finish the uh, would finish the second. I remember seeing the Rolling Stones when they were second on the bill to Lulu. Uh -huh. um, you know that was uh, that was in, in those very very early days. I never saw the Beatles, by the way. My wife did, but I never did. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's a, that's an odd pairing there, Lulu and the Rolling Stones. That's, that's it was package. It was a it was a package tour. I mean that that was at um, um, a thing called the Queen's Hall in Leeds, which was an old an old tram shed. It had been just all the trams taken out. It was just converted, but uh, yeah, that is a horrible building. We actually, I played there with uh, with the Raiders one time. It was it was horrible, horrible, horrible acoustics. But, uh, yeah. Well, uh, at, at what age did you begin to seriously consider a music career in your future? Um, I was with the Raiders band from. Nine well from being 14, so it's 1960 through to 65. So I was I was gigging, we were gigging all over the place, all over the north and, and, and wider. Um I'm not saying that I, I actually considered it as a career. It was it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. And I, and I enjoyed it and it, it did wonderful things for me, confidence and everything else, because it, the, the Raiders gave me that. That situation where I, I could, you know, if I'm talking to five people or 500 or 5,000, I couldn't care a damn. It doesn't make any difference. I mean, it, and it gave me that sort of confidence. And that, um, that was sort of invaluable, not just, funnily enough, in music, but in other things that I've done at other times during my, my other career. So, I mean, to start with, I'm not sure I actually really wanted a full-time career. Um, but all the time I was with the Raiders, I was sort of, I was doing the gigs, enjoying the gigs. But funny enough, somebody asked me on Facebook only a few weeks ago, you know, why I don't do many gigs now. It, it's, never been, it's never been central to me. I, I know a lot of people, once they get the, get the bug or once they start playing, they really get the bug. They always want to be on stage. And in fact, even when they're not on stage, they're on stage because of the way they act with other people and all of that sort of thing. And it, it sort of, over the years, which was six years that I was playing with the band, it sort of, it, it did everything I wanted to do. I'd done everything I wanted to do live. Mm -hmm. And then of course we had this, or I had this real epiphany in 1965 when I was 19, 
1965 is an incredible year for me because that was the year that I came across the Great Lead Belly. Okay. And the 12 string guitar. Okay. And that was also the year I came across Tom Paxton, uh, Phil Oakes, and the Electra stable, Jack Holtzman's mob, um, Judy Collins, Mark Spolster, people like that. Um, that was when, that 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 was an absolute opening year for me, because all I up to that point, up to '65, all I'd ever heard about the twelve string guitar was uh, George Harrison used it on the Beatles. You can't do that. That was a Ricky twelve string, and that was really all I'd heard. Um, but as soon as I heard Lead Belly, I thought, "Ooh, that is something. That is something different." And I don't know why. Because I mean, I heard Willie McTell and Willie McTell played the Stella 12 and all of that. But Lead Belly, it, it just, that hit me in a, in a very, very similar way to how Elvis had done, what are we saying, eight years earlier. Um, but 65 was something that really, really changed things for me. And that was why, in, well, that was, that was when I left the band and started thinking, okay, I'm going to develop in another direction. Now, I've been writing, so sorry, am I, I'm just rabbiting on here. Are you all right? No, I'm fine. Oh, okay. it, it brought up a, a few questions that I had. Oh, I mean, sorry. Go on, you're, go on. You're covering, no, you're covering, you're covering it. Yeah. No, all I was going to say, I mean, I, 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 I've always been a writer. As I say, when I was at school, I enjoyed English language. But when I, um, no, when I got into my teens, early teens, I started yeah, scribbling bits and bobs. It, it, it was doggerel, it was rubbish. But you, you, I got into the habit of writing and writing just for, my, for myself. And then with the Raiders, the band I was with, I, I wrote, we were playing in London. We were, uh, yeah, we were playing at this coffee bar in London. And um, I'd written this song called By My Side, which was just straight pop. I mean, it was sort of thing that Cliff Richard, if he'd had half an hour, he could have he could have done it. I wrote it for the band, and the band naturally is the old tall poppy syndrome that you've got with teenage kids. They obviously cut my legs off, and we never heard that. We'd rehearsed it, and then they cut my legs off, and that was it. That was the end of it. But I was writing songs of some kind, even even then, before I, I'd left the Raiders. It was when the Lead Belly. The, the Paxton, the Oaks thing hit in 65, that I suddenly thought, oh, yeah, yeah, because I'd always been interested in politics and I'd always been interested in, uh, as I say, in, in, in the language. And I thought, this is where these things, this is where these things come together. One question, which, sorry, I'm going to answer my own question now. Dylan, mm -hmm. who I love, or at least I did. It's not, it's not what he was now. Okay. But when Dylan came out, I was one of those people who, who sort of said, you know, oh, Bobby, yeah, yeah, he's a good writer, you know, but his songs are better sung by other people. And, and so whilst I like things like, obviously, Don't Think Twice, It's All Right, like a Rolling Stone and all of that, it didn't really, it didn't, Dylan didn't hit me. And I'm, I'm sort of eternally grateful for that at this stage because one thing that happens is if you get to like Dylan, and if you're caught in the Dylan trap, you become a Dylan imitator it, because he, he, the man is so pervasive that he gets into you and you automatically become not an imitator necessarily, the influence is too strong. And I was so pleased with the way that my style developed that I hadn't actually um, adopted a Dylan I did an interest to the extreme that it took that it, it actually took over what I was doing. So as it turns out, years later, I really did get into Dylan really big time. And I wrote a book on him and all of that, which came out in when was that? Oh god, can't remember, 98. Um, but so I really did get into Dylan, but I was well established as me and my style. Oh, for many, many years before I actually got into Dylan. The first Dylan album that I actually really liked with Dylan was Nashville Skyline, which is unbelievable because it's, I mean, it wasn't even sounding really like Dylan, but that was how it was. Sorry, I really am. I'm just, you ask me a question. No, no that, that's fine. That's fine. You know, I, I told you before, if you want to go off on a tangent or two, that, that's fine. You know, this could be stream of consciousness. You know, that, yes. that, that, that's no, all right. It's not. <laughs> it's no, not. I, I never, you know, 
I mean, I see what people uh, like about Dylan. You know, like I said, I see how, you know, you know, extremely influential he's been. But I can never get into his voice. You know, I'm sorry. Um, it's just a little, it's kind of whiny um, to me. Um, I know so, certain, you know, most fans just, well, listen to the words, listen to the lyrics. You know, mm -hmm. if, I can't, if, if I can't wrap my head around, if it's not pleasing, the, the voice to me, then it's really hard for me to. Yeah, but you see, I've, I've got I've got this 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 quirk in me that I happen to like weird voices. Now, I mean, Dylan is only one example. I mean, I, I quite like Louis Armstrong's voice, which is not exactly classical. There's a lady called Dame Clara Butts, who you may or may not have heard of, most remarkable woman, contralto, died in 1936, but she's I've done a whole website on her. Okay. Um, Oh, an unbelievable voice. I mean, it was said that you could hear her halfway across the English Channel and they didn't use mics in those days. I mean, this was an unbelievable voice. Dame Clara Butt, if anybody's watching this, check her out, unbelievable. But a very, very weird voice. Tom Waits, a weird voice. I, you know, I, I, really, I really do sort of gravitate towards the strange voices. But when you come to Bobby Dylan, yeah, I, I mean, in the early days, before I sort of got into him, I, I was with you. I mean, I would have said, no, 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 it's, it's not the voice. The songs, the songs are good. But there is something, there's something about the way Dylan, the early Dylan, yeah. interprets and works, not just, uh, not just his songs, but other people's songs as well. But I've, I don't know who it was that said this, but somebody made a very good, a good point saying that genius, if someone is a genius, the genius shows itself before you're 25. After you're 25, you might have been a genius, but all you're doing then is reinforcing what you've done. Up to 25, you have nothing to lose. And I mean, that applied with Einstein, and it certainly applied with Bob, because his really creative stuff came to that point. Since then, he's done some excellent stuff. Not so good now, but some excellent stuff. But not the, the, the seminal, inventive, beautiful, creative stuff that he did in those very early 60s albums those first three or four albums right in my humble opinion <laughs> well going back to uh, lead belly sorry yeah 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 that's fine what uh what what was it about discovering lead belly uh that, that changed your life what 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 can you uh pinpoint about about his him and his style and i don't know i, I wish i could put my finger on it he yeah. There was there was a genuineness about the guy. Um, there was a, I mean, a, a, a great skill. I mean, great skill with that stellar. And, and you, you know, we've got to remember that he didn't have the, the benefits of the miking and everything that we have these days. I, th I think, I suppose one has to admit there, there was something in his story. I mean, the story is, is, is a, a degree of romanticism about it. But it's just, I, I bought this album. It's behind me in that cupboard back there, actually, still. It's called Lead Belly Sings and Plays, and it was it's on the uh, the ARC label, and it just contained a whole bunch of of the basic the basic you know boys on the western plain John Hardy the John Hardy version with the twelve string not the squeeze box one, um, all all some uh, um, Tom Hughes Town some good basic Lead Belly. I just I bought that and I just listened to it, and I just thought oh dear yes. Oh, no. it, it, it was one of those seminal, those seminal moments. And I, I wish, Greg, I honestly wish I could say to you, yeah, this is what it was. I can't. I really, I really can't. But it, 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 it changed things. And I went, I went out and I, I, I flogged my, uh, I had a Hofner V3, which was like a Euro copy of a, a Fender. Couldn't afford Fender. I say couldn't afford Fenders. Fenders were taxed so high to get them into this country. They weren't coming in anyway. But... Um, I sold my, my Hofner V3 and I bought um, a Hoyer 12 and um, started being a sort of a Yorkshire version of Lead Belly. Not, not, not as successfully as he was, but I mean, there's a, there's a picture, oh, picture of me somewhere, um, actually almost looking like Lead Belly. I think I had a dicky bow on and everything, the whole, the whole deal. I wasn't doing the, the pointing up that Lead Belly did. <laughs> but no, yeah, I mean, it just blew me away. When I, when I first heard him, and I wish I could put the finger on it, but, but one thing, one other thing, 
as I say, in 65, we had the, um, the revelation with Paxton and, and with Jack Holtzman's electro label, because that had so much uh, going for it that I was just thinking, well, you know, there's more and more to look at here. Right. So I looked at, I looked at Oaks, I looked at uh, Judy Collins, and then I found that Jack Holtzman had actually put out Lead Belly's Library of Congress recordings, mm. which I bought and which I found. And also the Library of Congress for Woody Guthrie and a couple of other box sets as well. But all of this began to cement, it didn't, didn't just cement me with Lead Belly, it cemented me with Electra and everything that was around that. And that has an ongoing uh, effect for later on when I actually started doing something actively with the 12. Yeah, there have been some, um, I want to say recent, not, not real recent, but uh, releases on that Electra label of some of those older folk singers, you know. Mm. Uh, I, I picked up one, Fred Neal. Oh, yeah, yeah. A couple, a couple of his albums that were... Yeah, yeah. Really, really, really showed a different side of him. Did you, did, you, did you ever hear any of the Theo Bikel stuff? Theodore Bikel. Spell that, or... B-I-K-E-L. Theodore. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Sorry, yes, yes. Because he started... I mean, really, Jack, yeah. Holt, he, Jack Holtzman's label in the early days was built on what uh, what Theo Bikel did. Yeah. Um, and then, well, obviously, Jack Holtzman moved away and moved on, but uh, it, it was those early folk days, as you say, Fred Neal, um, and, well, and others, but it was those it was those days on Electra that, you know, it all came together to me in 1965, and particularly, as I say, with Lead Belly and the Lead Belly Library of Congress recordings. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, for, uh, for those viewers who don't exactly know the difference, could you explain uh, the appeal of the 12 string guitar versus just the regular six string? Oh, oh, oh yes. Um, the, the 12 string is not just a six string with six additional strings. I think you've got to sort of realize that. Also, a lot of people, when they start playing the 12 string, like the sound and then get very bored with it very, very quickly. Um, because they can think if you try and play it just like a six, then it can seem like a one trick pony, but it isn't. It, it, it really does have the ability to uh, have its own character and to develop um, as, an, as an instrument in its own right. So, I mean, I, I, I tune mine very similarly to how Led Belly tuned his. He tuned, he tuned down to C, so the top string was C, the bass strings were C. Uh, I'm one. I'm one fret load enough. I go down. I go down to B, and I can do that because nowadays I I get custom made strings. Not not custom made. A custom a custom packaged. Uh, some people put them together for me. So I've got strings that that do produce that resonance and, and don't rattle when they're, when they're tuned down that far. But if it it, it is interesting when the Beatles, as I say, they they first used the twelve string on. You can't do that. And the world and his dog went out and started buying 12 strings uh, just because George Harrison had played one. Uh, and then all of a sudden they came piling back into the into the music shops because people realized that once they'd had them for a while, strummed on them for a while, pretty boring stuff. And so get rid. And I, I took advantage of that because, oh, well, actually, my when I when I bought my Hoyer, unfortunately. I was at uh, Reading University, got stolen out of my van. Bad day, bad day. I'd actually just, funny if I'd just been at Polydor in London uh, doing some test recordings that afternoon. And then I went out to Reading Uni and uh, I literally left the, left the guitar in the van, in the, my, I just had a little old Austin van. Went into the university to check in, came out, guitar gone. Mm. And that caused me a big, big problem. But I was very fortunate because I managed to get hold of my Harmony 12 string, uh, American Harmony, obviously, it, um, made in Chicago. And um, because all of these guitars have been piling back into, uh, into the music shops and into the, the instrument shops, I managed to get it pretty cheap because they'd had to bring the prices down. It wasn't second hand, it was brand new, but they would had to bring the prices down. So I got I got my Harmony 12, my 68 Harmony 12, uh, 67 actually it was made. Still got it now. That's what I use on on all my 
all my current recordings, and it, it, frankly, that guitar's better on than I am, to be honest. <laughs> but, uh, no, I mean that that that's the, the, the difference. The difference between the the, the techniques and are, uh, are much more. Um, if you're sensible with a twelve string, you use open strings a lot. So even if you're playing a chord, oh, I don't know, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth fret. If you can find as part and parcel of that chord the opportunity to leave a string open, so whichever course it may be, the top course, whatever, if you can, it, get, it just perpetuates the ring, which and the ring is far greater than you would ever get with a sixth string. So I, if anybody's really wanted, if, if anybody actually is interested in buying a 12 string and wants some advice on it or wants some, some thinking on it, my email address is on my website. Give me a give me a call. I'd be only too happy to advise because, quite honestly, it's a beautiful instrument, and they, sh they should be better known. But the bottom line is, most people just use them as a, as a rhythm instrument. They're far more than that. Right, right. There's a lot more potential to to. Uh, oh God, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, um, when was the uh, first time that you went into a recording studio and recorded? What what year was it? Um, a professional studio would be 68. 68. That was Poly no, yeah, that was Polydor in London. And I went, <laughs> yeah, that, you know, it, it's funny because when I initially, when I, when I started out writing the sort of songs I write now, how I actually was really looking at myself very, very much more as a writer than, than a player. Um, and a, than a performer, although I'd done all those years with the Raiders. Um, and I was sending songs off to music publishing companies. That was, that was my, that's a, oh, I don't know how many songs off to, to individual companies, uh, but it was the usual sort of thumbs down, you know. And so fair enough, that's the way it goes. And then this business about, about Lead Belly, Electra, 1965, Paxton, uh, that that was still sort of with me, and so I thought, well, why not? Why not? Why not? And so I sent a tape to Electra in London, Clive Selwood. I didn't know it was him then. And absolute surprise, surprise, he came back and said, mm, "Yeah, would you be interested in coming down to do um, to do a test?" So, yes, <laughs> yes, I would. So I got on the phone to his his secretary, lovely lady, Sylvia, Sylvia Nella, and um, shot off down to London and went into this, the, the, the Electra was distributed by Polydor in London, in England at the time. And so I went into their studio in Stratford Place in London, and they just simply set up a couple of mics, guitar, voice, and that was it. Clive Selwood was in the in the control booth, engineer was there, and I remember Clive was just, he was lying on a bench in the control, and I could just see his feet actually sticking up above the glass. And uh, he, 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 I sang a couple of songs, so he said, yeah, do another one, Bob. Okay, so I'll do another one. Do another one, Bob. Let's have another one. Do another one, Bob. And I kept, we did, I can never remember whether it was 21 or 22, we just did 22, and something like that, straight off like that. And in the end, we he, he we, and his feet were still up there behind the glass. And in the end, he, he came out and said, yeah, that's, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. So have you got any more, many more songs? I said, I've, got, I've got quite a few. I, I'd probably about 40 at that time, something like that. I said, I've, got, I've got a few. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. So he said, well, you know, it's not, it's not down to me uh, because he said that Jack is the one that says yes or no to all artists on Electra. So I'm going to send it off. To the states and we'll see what comes and, all right fine so that was that and then he bummed a lift out to his home in slough in my van so i think he wanted uh, i think he, he wanted pain pretty well for the, for the session anyway the point was i didn't hear anything for a while and then i got that uh, what is now reasonably famous letter which came and said really sorry but jack doesn't want you however um john is opening this label called Dandelion. Would you be interested in doing an album? And I thought, wow, because and in those days, if you were starting out in any way, you started with a single. Mm -hmm. And a single, and then if that single worked, then maybe you might get another one. And if that worked, you might get an EP out of it. You know, 
And they came to me to start with, all right, fine. I mean, I, I bunged down those 20 odd tracks and they knew I had the songs. Um, and so do you want to do an album? Mm, I do. So that was that was how that, that came about. And of course, 1917 Revolution, the single came off the album, and that was the literally the first the first release for Dandelion, which went to number one. I don't know if you know it, number one in the Lebanon of all places, but there you are. You were thankful for small mercies, really. <laughs> do you have any idea or can you explain or has anyone tried to explain why it was so popular no nope. Selwood never knew no nope, no nope. <laughs> none of us ever knew the only thing you can think of there was this uh, there was a, an uprising going on um at the time in the Lebanon, 1917 revolution i don't know whether it caught it caught some sign that some kind of zeitgeist in in the in the lebanon but uh i mean it was the time that david bowie was in on the chart there um Space Oddity, uh, Boy Named Sue, Johnny Cash, they were all in there. And then there's me sort of sitting at number one, which is all very nice. But uh, as Selwood always said, we didn't get much money out of it. So. <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't, I don't, I honestly don't know why. I, I really do not know why. Yeah. Um, but as the, as the, as the, the uprising fell off, so did the record. So read into that what you will. <laughs> okay. Uh, was this the first that you had ever heard of John Peel? Oh no! Oh no! No no! Uh, I mean, Peely was a very uh, when when he came back from the states. You know, he, he'd been in the states. Yeah. He was uh, he was known as John Ravencroft. Right, right. Yeah. In wasn't America. it wasn't a uh, station o Oklahoma City? Or? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It was in it was in Oklahoma, but okay. he uh, John was. Uh, I mean, his name was Ravenscroft with an S in the middle of it, but he was known in the states as John Ravencroft. And then when he came back to uh, to the UK. This was just around the time that the uh, oh, it used to be very difficult here to um, the, the the music radio was governmental control pretty well the BBC um, the pirate radio station set up and the pirate radio station started attracting good DJs like uh, Emperor Roscoe and uh, John and uh, he was on Radio London. Uh, eventually, the pirates they, they found ways to, to shut them down, but the BBC has sort of learned its lesson. And so, some of these very, very good DJs, very powerful DJs, and very charismatic DJs were brought in from the pirates uh, into what was now going to be called a wonderful Radio One, which was all right. I mean, it was actually pretty good. Um, it was a pretty good station. Now, John was on there from day one. Um, I didn't know of him before that. I didn't know of him from the pirate times, but I certainly knew of him from the start of Radio One. And uh, of course, I mean, I mean, literally, actually, he was on Radio One until the day he died. So he was the, by far and away the longest serving DJ, but a very, very innovative bloke and a lovely bloke as well. I mean, he, there was no side to him at all. He was a, he was a fantastic chap. So that's what I wanted to ask you if you had any John Peel stories, uh, you know. <laughs> One or two, one or two. Because I'll tell you one thing, um, and again, I don't know if you know this, but um, when Dandelion opened in Holland, um, we went over, I, I went over there, um, played place in Amsterdam when they did the launch. Um, Bridget was there, Madison Head, and a few of us, and John. And so we went over, we did the gig and opened everything up in, in Amsterdam and everything. It was all very nice. Anyway. Come the evening, we were staying at a big hotel called the Schiller, one of it still exists. Um, and we'd, we'd eaten our dinner and we all congregated in John's not very big room. It wasn't a suite or anything like that. And he was, he was sort of regaling us with all sorts of bits and bobs of, of stories. One of which was, um, and I won't bother trying to imitate his accent because it would be, it would be impolite. One of which was that he had been in the room in Dallas police headquarters when Jack Ruby shot Lee Harvey Oswald. Okay. And we thought, yeah, yeah, nice one, you know, okay, not falling for that, you know. <laughs> it was. Yeah, and it's I... been, uh, yeah, yeah, um, I've seen that the, the, after John died, uh, there was obviously quite a lot of, of uh, press coverage and media coverage here. And um, there, there, was, there was that particular scene of uh, the Ruby when uh, Jack Ruby shot shot Lee, Lee Harvey Oswald and then the camera swings round to the all the people that were in the in the police headquarters at the time 
camera froze. Mm -hmm. It was P. So he was yeah. he was actually there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, it's remarkable. Fascinating. Yeah. I, I, heard, heard, I had heard that story. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you had. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. But no, oh, that's all right. But he, no, he a lot was, of people haven't haven't heard. Yeah. That yeah. True. But he was a, no. John was a was a great fellow. Last uh, last time I saw him was we all oh, it was many many years ago. We were at a, my wife and I were at a Tangerine Dream gig in uh, York Minster, big a big cathedral in York, and John and Sheila were there, and that was the last time I saw him. But because um, I see the thing was that after Dandelion folded, which it did in 1972, very influential label in many ways, but short lived. And in 1972, Dandelion folded, and then at the same time, I got offered a really solid promotion in my day job. And it was all of a sudden, people on the label were looking for new, looking for new labels to go with. And I'm here without a contract, and I've got this big promotion at work. Mm -hmm. It was a no brainer. Yeah. So I took it. And the weird thing is that from 1972 through to 1995, so we're talking 23 years, other than a couple of bootlegs, not a single bow track or John Trevor track was released anywhere in the world, anywhere, on anything. Right. 23 years. And then in 1995, C for Miles Records brought out uh, the Bow and the Creation album on a two for one. Mm -hmm. And John did an interview for a magazine, name I can't remember, Interzone, Interzone magazine. And that, um, he, he was sort of mentioning 1917 Rev and, and uh, what it had done and all of that. And all of a sudden the thing started to snowball. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are where we are now. So about you know, 14 or 15 albums later. You know? it's, it's, it's really fascinating uh, how things like that happen. Yeah, it's just, it's just, the, it's, it's just, it's just the way it goes. But uh, yeah. you know, it's funny. It's funny because when I think back to the, the 60s, once the, 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 the British invasion had taken place in, in the US and the Beatles and the Stones had really started, and the Yardbirds had started exporting blues back to America, all of a sudden, this side of the pond, we started getting very interested in people like Sonny Boy Williamson and Howlin' Wolf and uh, all of those kind of guys, you know, uh, oh, Mississippi John Hurt. I mean, there, there were loads of. So all of a sudden, these guys who had been out of the scene for, you know, been janitors and this sort of thing, came, came out of the woodwork and came over here, started playing. Mm -hmm. And they were going down an absolute storm. And merely because of their, their age and their, and their longevity, they were, they were, they were really getting, getting very, very well regarded. I've got a horrible feeling, I'm in that sort of position now, that just because I'm, I'm, I'm old and I've stuck with this as long as I have, all of a sudden, younger people who are like my music think this guy's an old guy, like we thought about Sonny Boy Williamson, we thought about Alan Wolf back in the 1960s. So maybe I'm just I'm just reliving that dream, you know. Yeah. Well, there's a yeah. I mean, the <laughs> internet the internet has has had a lot to do with that. Oh well, yeah. Yeah, definitely. People getting in touch and different websites that that are that are out there that you know people can find out about some of these older artists and listen to them, you know. And discover, you know, a lot of a lot of the talent that has been there for for a, you know a long time. Oh, it just absolutely. Kind of, kind of needs to be, you know, uh, discovered again. You know, and absolutely. But after, I mean, when going back to that, that 1965 epiphany for me, um, yes, Lead Belly was in the stores, but not everybody was at that point. It was starting because again, the Beatles, the Stones, the Yardbirds and others that had this tremendous effect of, of sort of causing interest this side of the water in old timey American music. So we were getting things like, you know, Louisiana Cajun music was coming over, um, the, the, the hillbilly stuff, the bluegrass. I mean, we were getting in, into our record stores. We were getting a great multiplicity of things. I could, in that couple of behind you, I said, I could show you quite, I've still got them. Uh, all of these, all of these old records then, that I bought on oh, the Yazoo label and all sorts of things from way, way, way back. John Fay, 
all of a sudden started to get popular with his Tacoma label. You know, all of these things were coming over here. And a lot, all of this really stemmed from the Beatles and what they had managed to do. I mean, the, the, the effect that the Beatles had on music across the world isn't just their music, it was the influences and the influences that they opened up. Oh, it's stunning, stunning. Do you, do you have any of the uh, Alan Lomax recordings? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That... Oh, yeah, back there. I, I mean, Alan Lomax, I, I mentioned that um, Jack, Jack Olson did the, uh, the Lead Belly Library of Congress. He also did the Woody Guthrie mm -hmm. Library of Congress box set. It's back there. And that was entirely Alan Lomax. That's Alan Lomax interviewing Woody Guthrie uh, for the Library of Congress. So, oh, yeah, I've got, I've got a lot of, of Lomax's stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, back to John Peel. He, he was so uh, instrumental in, in, you know, helping jumpstart throughout the years, you know. Yeah, he was. Musicians and bands. And I think after a while, a lot of bands up and coming would say, okay, let's try to get a John Peel session. If we can get oh, yeah. a Peel session, then you know that we're starting to, you know, break through, you know, and get that exposure. You know? Oh, yeah. I mean, he, he was... He... Yeah, he, he was a one. He was a wonderfully open, open fella. Um, the only thing, it's not. It's not the but. He he hated confrontation in any way. Um, Clive was his manager. Clive Sol was his manager, and Shirley, Shirley Clive's wife, uh, they sort of managed John's career very successfully. Never had a contract with him. Never had anything signed. This wasn't an Elvis Colonel Parker thing. Um, but they looked after him and, and he sort of appreciated it. And where any difficulties came up, then Clive and Shirley, but particularly Clive in, that, in those circumstances, sort of looked after it for him. And uh, they had a very, very good relationship right the way through, as far as I know, and certainly in the time that I, I was, well, I was connected with Clive right to the day he died, actually. Well, within a fortnight of his dying. But um, in the time that I knew him and John together, Right. Never, a, never a serious word. Blah. Yeah. You know, just, just a good, good person. You know. Yeah. And ha had great taste in music. <laughs> oh, wonderful. yeah, wonderful. I mean, not, not. I'll tell you what, what really was a bit annoying. I went uh, one time. I was at John's flat. Uh, where's it been? It's a muse, little cottage actually, just off the Marylebone Road in London. Um, then I went up upstairs and there was a sort of a little winding staircase and it had these, these rack fulls of, of, of record, I mean, groaning, groaning records on the wall. Surprised the wall held them actually. But I was, I was looking through those. And as I come up the stairs, there's this little guy behind me, sort of behind the stairs, just, he was playing a sitar and he was, he was Mark Boland, you know, T-Rex. Oh, yeah. But in those days, he was still Tyrannosaurus Rex with Perry Tuck. I um, think he was stoned, but anyway, I, I, I said, hi, and he just, hi, and that was it. What really hurt John a little bit was after Boland got big with T-Rex, yeah. he was quite actively dismissive of what John had done, and John had done so much for Tyrannosaurus Rex. Um, the, the, the amount of time that he had given to them promoting them, he really believed in them. And Boland was not particularly generous when it came to John. But there you are. That's showbiz, isn't it? Yeah, I didn't really appreciate that. Yeah. Well, well, going back uh, to the single 1917 Revolution, yeah. about the uh, Russian Revolution, um, what um, I found this interesting. What other than the line, we turned our horses to the sun, was inspiration for America's a horse with no name? No idea. Absolutely yeah. no idea. I don't, I don't, I don't get there's, that. There's something, there's something in the, um, if you listen to horse with no name, there, is, there, is, there are a couple of, of chordal progressions mm -hmm. that you can say, well, yeah, okay, there's, there might be an, in, an influence there or whatever. I, I read that, it was in the magazine. I can't remember which magazine it was. And I, I just didn't believe it because I thought this is ridiculous yeah. until I found out, of course, they had actually been based. Because, oh, there's that old story that you, you possibly know, but 1917 Rev was never released in the States. Okay. You get it now in Walmart, that shows how threatening I am now. But um, you, you, you can actually, the, the, the 
the album that it comes from was just re-released on vinyl just last year, and it's in Walmart. So Walmart, anybody? Um, but uh, yeah, it, it, what I didn't realize, because it hadn't been released in America, I thought, well, it doesn't seem sensible. I mean, they would never have heard the darn thing, except I then found out that all of their parents were over here, um, right. based in, uh, you know, doing their, their service here. And the families were with them, so and the time tied in. So yeah, I mean, they got hold of the record and it, it did something for them. But I'm like you. I mean, I've got apart from a few bits and bobs, I can't do anything. Yeah, I don't. I don't either. I, I, maybe um, they'll the two members that are still around and should be probably asked that question. I'll try to get an interview. Do that. Do that, please. <laughs> right. If you do, yeah. if you do, tell me. Tell me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, uh, your first album, simply title Bo came out in 69 mm. uh what are your memories uh surrounding that release and the recording of it and and everything uh the recording we did broadly broadly we did it one day um time was money in the studio and uh, didn't didn't want nobody wanted to be wasting too much time and dandelion wasn't exactly flush so i mean and, and say clive knew that i had the songs and he knew that i could i could do them without having to make too much fuss about it. So uh, I toddled off down to London. Uh, we did them at um, CBS Studios in New Bond Street, which is Columbia. And um, I turned up there about 11 o'clock one morning. The, the, the engineer, a chap called Mike Ross, who was a, a very, very good engineer, actually. Uh, he was a house engineer. He just finished an overnighter with The Who. The Who had been in the, in the studio all night. I don't know what time they left, probably about seven or eight in the morning. But after that point, Mike Ross had, had to clear up the studio and do everything that you have to do after clearing up after the who. And I turned up, I think it was about 11 o'clock. And uh, the studio was all ready. Clive had told him who did, you know, this is a, it's a, it's a folky, it's just a guitar and voice. It's not going to be rocket science for you. So I wandered in there, tuned my guitar to the piano, because I didn't have a tuner in those days. It wasn't like that, you just tune it to the piano. And then Mike Ross said, oh, play me something. I, I played him, I can't remember what. Um, and he said, mm, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know what we need for your voice. I know what we need for your guitar. Brings out the mics, puts the, builds the, 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 the sound boards and everything around me. I could see the studio and we started. And by about five o'clock, not much later, we'd done the lot. I mean, we had, we had 14 tracks. Some of them had been a few takes, but a lot of them, I was used to singing the songs, and we, we'd gone straight the way through. And in the end, it was, you know, I just got in, got in the car, drove back up to, up to Leeds, and I was back at work the following morning, and, and that was it. The thing was, we had got another session booked for three days later. And that it had been booked to start with for the very simple reason that we didn't know we were going to get everything done in the one day anyway. But also it came in handy for anything that any bits of tidying up or any bits of cleaning up that needed doing. So I, in the meantime, we got all these 14 songs done. And uh, two nights afterwards, I just dropped my now wife, uh, back at her back at her folks' place. And I, I went out for a drive in the country, which I often used to do. I'm still I'm a late bird now. I never go to bed before one in the morning now, anyway. So I drove out, and there's a place just outside of Leeds. It's the highest point of Leeds, actually. It's, it's called Cookridge. There's a water tower, huge water tower. Reason the water tower is there, it's the highest point. So you get the water. That's why, that's why it's there. And I got this idea. I'm just driving up towards Cookridge. And I've got this idea. And I pulled in next to the water tower. And I've got this song going through my mind. Few words, it's all there. I drove straight home. I wrote the words down. I got my tape recorder out. And on the kitchen table, I just demoed this song just quickly. It's the only song that I've ever, ever written that is as it is now. It never got altered. And this was this song called A Nation's Pride. Okay. And I thought, this is pretty good, pretty good song. Two days later, we're back in the studio in, uh, in London. 
and John was in there. John hadn't been in there for the first session with, with Mike Ross, but he was in there for the second. So um, we, we all met up and how's things going? And you know, we've checked the, checked the recordings, they all sound pretty good. We'll try a couple of things again, the slower version of the 1917 revolution didn't work. Um, and I said, I, I have got this thing that I just wrote literally two nights ago. None of you are interested. So I played it, Nation's Pride. And they said, yeah, we, we, we're very interested. So that, re that recording went down on that day. Another track called Time, which was going to be on the album, got bumped off it. And as it turned out, A Nation's Pride opened up side two of the album. Very interesting from my point of view, I literally and completely forgotten that Time had ever existed until 2000 and no, 1997. Mm -hmm. Steve Miles brought out a, a sampler and it had time on it. And I, when I saw it, I saw it in a store. I didn't get a copy free. And I saw, I thought, what? And I, I actually, I bought this thing. I took it home and listened to it. Oh, yeah, that was me. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Mm -hmm. that, but it, if I hadn't written that Nation's Pride in that little interim between the two sessions, time would have been on the album. But there you are. As you yeah. say, these things happen. They happen like that. Well, how long after the uh, release uh, was it before you started getting some feedback? Uh, were there any write-ups or any? Oh yeah, yeah. It's pretty pretty immediate um, because Clive, well, obviously, you know, I mean, this is, he worked at Electra. They got uh, an Electra. Electra was controlled by Polydor, and they had the the access to all of their um, uh, all of their publicity department, and of course, they monitored all the music press, all the local press, everything. So yeah, I mean, he was he was getting all the, the reviews that were coming in and sending them through to me. My mother kept them in a scrapbook. Uh -huh. All over. Mothers do these things, and um, yeah, I mean, the the, the the reviews were good. I mean, there, one guy didn't or one um, love affair. Who who's the lead singer of love affair? Can't remember. Uh, I know. Yeah, so do I. It'll come back to me. He hated it. Yeah. He, he, he was he was asked to he have you google him through he was um steve somebody steve ellis steve, steve ellis thank you kindly well done yeah he was Go asked ahead. to review it he was asked to review it for some magazine or other he hated it i never liked love affair particularly anyway so <laughs> but no he, he he really disliked it but but apart from that actually he got he got pretty good reviews but we had this we had this problem and it was a problem. Jack Holtzman had said, you know, to, to Clive, you know, you're doing the dandelion. You know, we will we will license them for the States. And so people like Bridget got out in the States and uh, uh, Siren got out in the States. Fine. I didn't. And I thought the reason was uh, I really did think that the reason for that was very probably that he turned me down for Electra that time before and okay, not our, not our back. The reason he turned me down, by the way, as it turns out, wasn't he didn't like me, he moved on because Paxton and Oaks and all of that, that was fine. But by the time I came on the scene, he was into Doors and Love and Clear Light and a whole bunch of other people that were way, way on from the folk scene. Right. So, I, but I thought at that time, it's because you know, Jack Holton didn't like me sort of thing. Turns out, no. Um, Clive, bless him, had been put in a 1917 revolution and I always appeared in, in a black uh, black t-shirt and uh, all, all the whole thing. He'd been putting it out quite wildly that I was a, I was a committed and signed up communist. And I, I, don't, I never was, I never was. I was telling a good story with 1917 Rev, but, but I, I, I was not a committed communist. I, I never was at all. But Clive was putting it out that I was. Mm. Mm. That gets back to Jack, of course. And this is the time of Barry Goldwater. Keep that in mind. Goldwater had a lot of influence. And it was, I, I, it was deemed that I would be, um, it was not conducive. Mm -hmm. So I was not released in America because that could have been dangerous. And I could actually have threatened your whole future, but I didn't, <laughs> it turns out. But as I say, now you can buy the damn thing in Walmart. <laughs> Times have changed. How do you know you haven't threatened my whole future? Ah, good point, good point. <laughs> <laughs> that's I I wouldn't have thought about that but yeah at that time 
you know, the Red Scare and all. I mean, oh, that yeah. was, was still going on, you know, in the Cold War and yeah, wow. Oh yeah, Gold, I mean, Goldwater, Goldwater was still a still a force in the land, and it was just it was just figured it was going to apparently. I only found this out. I found this out from Shirley Selwood, uh, not not that long before she died actually. Uh, I don't know what we're talking about at the time, but she told me that that was the reason. It was because I was seen, you know, I was I was regarded as being a communist threat, mm. which I wasn't. But there you are. Well, by, by just the sheer fact of the theme of the song, I mean, the, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. I mean, I mean, uh, it's, it's it's fair, it's fair enough. I mean, it's, it's just the way it. Just the way it was, but it's a shame. I, I, I'd like it to have got out in America at the time, but I mean, you know, what goes around comes around. It is, it's, it's available now, so if anybody wants it, and if you know, obviously on, on YouTube and everything, you can listen to these darn things till the cows come home. So <laughs> right. nothing's lost. <laughs> exactly. Well, um, when did you and uh, the band The Way We Live uh, come into the same orbit? Oh, that was. Um, Probably that would be 19, back end of 1970. Um, Clive, Clive got in touch with me and said, you know, second album, we need, we need another album. Okay, I mean, I've I'd got, I'd got plenty of material already written. And he said, um, we just signed this, this band, other side of the Pennine, Steve. I was in Leeds, they're in Rochdale, it's just over the top of the Pennine. Um, he said they're good. They're they're a, they're they're a, a broadly a heavy prog band, but they are flexible and they don't just play heavy. They don't just play electric. They they're sort of they're, they're working with all sorts of styles. And he said he was just bringing out an album called Mike Heart Bleeds, okay. uh, by a guy who used to be in a band called the Liverpool Scene, Mike Hart. And he said, look, he said. We haven't brought this thing out yet, but I'll send you a reel to reel of the My Car album. He said, this is the sort of subtle backing that we might be interested in thinking about anyway. Um, so he said, will you have a listen to it? Yeah, fine. So I had to listen to it. Oh, okay, nice, nice enough, you know, that's fine. Um, so I said, yeah, sure, I'm only too happy. So I toddled over the, over the Pennines to um, John Briley. He, they were a three-man outfit, although John, the third man, was actually the producer and the, and the electronics man, um, whereas the, the, the guys who played the instruments were Jim Milner and Steve Clayton. Jim, all guitars, Steve, all percussion, Jim, bass, Jim, all harmonized vocals, the whole lot. And John was the sort of maestro that kept everything going. And John had a, a sort of studio in his bedroom uh, over, at, uh, over in Rochdale. So I went over there guitar in hand, and we had a bit of a get together, a bit of a run through. And they were more than happy to work in with sort of, you know, just a, a folky guy. And, 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 and I mean, we're still friends. We are still friends, actually. Um, and it just worked. So we said, well, OK, well, let's, let's, you know, let, let's do it. So I said to Clive, yes. And they were sort of brought on board for uh, working with me on the second album. Not every track, but uh, that some of the big tracks, in particular, I think, got Silent Returns, which, which was is quite cataclysmic in some of the stuff that Jim did. But um, yeah, we, we 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 did this. We rehearsed and rehearsed in in John's studio, and then um, we repaired off down to Birmingham, in in our Midlands, um, to to a studio there called Hollick and Taylor, and we put it there about well, three days, and we we put it down there. Then. Yeah, did, did you ever get Thunderbirds? I think it's a, a puppet show. Did you ever get that in America? Probably. Yeah. Did you? Oh, yeah. okay. Guy, the guy who um, who ran that, a close friend of Clive's actually, was a chap called Jerry Anderson. Um, but they did all of their sound mm -hmm. uh, at Hollick and Taylor. And John Taylor, who was a very nice man, uh, but he was more attuned to Thunderbirds and Lady Penelope than he was to a rock band like us. So we'd done the recording, and that was fine. But we thought for the mix, maybe not. So we took the uh, the tapes off down to the marquee in London, um, did the and did the mix of creation there. Um, well, I was I was there, and John Riley was there, Jim and Steve were, um, and that was how that how that came about. But uh, oh, it was uh, it was it was a good experience. It was a good experience. But that 
I mean, it, it turned out to be really quite a popular album, actually. Yeah, right. I was going to say. Well, let me ask you about John Brierley. Um, mm -hmm. Any relation to Mark? No. Do you, okay. No. You know who Mark? You know who Mark Brier is. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I did an interview with him uh, last year. Welcome to the Citadel. Okay. I just thought that's not a real, real common name, but. No, I know. No, they're a different part of the country. But I, yeah. look, I'm saying no. I, I'm, I'm as certain as I can be. There's no relationship. I've certainly never heard of it. And I think JB would have mentioned it to me if there was. To be honest. Right. Right. And when I when I look it up on the internet, I don't see any. You know, real, you know, talking yeah. about it or anything like that. Okay. Well, um, later on, of course, the way we live uh, morphed into Tractor, mm. as your backing band. Um, but talking about creation, uh, you know, probably most fans are most familiar with this album and yeah. a favorite of theirs. Yeah. Uh, so you think it was a good a good mix of styles? You're, oh yeah, you know, yeah, Robin. yeah. I I I did actually. I mean it. It did work. It worked very, very well. And also, um, with things like the track creation itself, which is all sort of spacey and whooshy and all sorts of, uh, of things like that, I, it, it, was, it wasn't avant-garde, but it was moving in that direction. Now, for several years, although I'm best known as I'm really am a, a bit of a folky, but... I've really had a great, a great interest in the avant-garde over a long time, whether it's Stockhausen or Lucas Foss or Martin Sobotnik, or I mean, all the, these sort of people, Yogi Ligeti. Um, and working with Tractor gave me a little bit of an opportunity to play along in that sort of, in that sort of milieu. So you had some, where, where in creation, I mean, a lot of the, the, the sounds created are not synthesizers because there was no synthesizers. Well, the, the big, the big, all, most of the whooshing and everything else you can hear is actually my elbow and a far feaser organ, and then uh, all in the mix. But I mean, we we did we did, and of course it, the, the whole track is whispered, which is a, a bit a bit weird. But we did we did that we did that. It gave me a chance to do these little bit of a bit of avant garde things, which. Sorry, jumping forward 50 years, really, when I started being doing Symphonica, that gave me a chance to, to do that, which is wholly electronic, and which is, you know, about, it, it, shall we use the word niche? We'll be kind, I'll be kind to me and say it's niche. It, it sure is niche. <laughs> but, but having said that, I mean, it, the, the, the roots of it were there in creation and further back with my interest in, in people like Stockhausen, Lucas Foss, uh, uh, et al., you know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, yeah, I was going to ask you some of your favorites off of that that album. What, what, oh, well, I mean, the, the the big one is obviously Silence Returns, isn't it? I mean, Silent Silence Returns. Silence Returns was really really bizarre. I mean, I people sort of asked me sort of you know why did this damn thing suddenly go from being nice little gentle folky folky wheeze into this sudden sort of explosion of of, of fuzz guitar. When I wrote Silence Returns, the song, the lyric, if you, if you listen to it, is about what I've described as the violence of silence. That is, you know, people who don't say things when they could, who cut people off. It's, it's, it's like, what should we say? It's like if someone dies and you, some people refuse to talk to you or a dog can't talk to you because, because they're embarrassed or the violence of silence. Right. Anyway, that's what, the, that's what the, the lyric was about. And what I wanted was the second half to reflect this violence of silence. Mm -hmm. So we did it and um, we went through, it. obviously I sang the first, uh, the, the first part and then I continued my riff going. Jimbo was there, he was he, he's doing his bass and so it, Steve was going like, you, you remember Animal from the Muppets? Yes. <laughs> Steve played. Absolutely. I mean, if you listen to Steve's drum work on um, uh, on Silence Returns, it is it is stunning. But anyway, the point is, it, it, sound, it, it, sound, it sounds like oh, uh, Mickey. Who oh, can't remember his name? Uh, the guy that played drums on, um, on 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 Dylan's Like a Rolling Stone at the uh, the Judas gig. Oh, can't remember. It'll come back to me. But the drumming on on Silence Returns is so powerful and so clipped. So we're going through all of that in the studio. 
Jim's on bass, I'm on guitar, um, and Steve's going crazy. Then it comes to it that Jim has to create a solo, which he's going to play over the top. So we do that, and he does this, and it, and it was a, a stunning solo. It was a one-off, I doubt he could do it again. I don't think he would want to even try, but it, <laughs> it was a stunning solo. So great, terrific. We take it down to the marquee, and luckily I was there, said John Briley was there, uh, Phil Dunn was the engineer. And uh, when it comes to this business with uh, the Jim Solo, which was obviously done on a separate track, they could not get that trigger moment because it, the, the uh, it was da 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 da, and it's, it's, it's a little bit of a strange, a strange timing figure. And they could not get when Jim's guitar was going to was going to to crash in, so they give me a little red a little red switch and my finger. I'm sitting there with this. So this thing is going to. And my job, my sole job, my sole job in this mix is to trigger Jim's guitar. So Jim's guitar is going on like hell in the background, but nobody can hear it. And then it comes up, and just when I know it's going to be right, I flick that switch and bah, straight in. And it is. I mean, it is surprising. And people, you know, people, it has, it has actually very kindly been regarded and written, written up as one of the most startling moments in rock. It probably is, because it started, it started with me when I first heard it, even with my own headphones on. But also when they did the mix, they did a very, very fast slap back from left to right, so it, like that. I mean, that was my contribution to the mix of, of Silence Returns. But that track has become somewhat iconic, and that solo has. So well done, Jim. If you watch, <laughs> well done, Jim. Well, well, good on your timing there too. Yeah. Oh well, yeah. But I knew it. I'd, I'd written the darn thing, Greg. Yeah. You know. <laughs> right, right. Well, um, I must say, up until recently, what you talked about, you know, being available in Walmart, uh, your music has been very rare and extremely hard to find. I, I have to say, um, and a lot of it uh, fetching a pretty penny. Yeah, too yeah. much. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's too much. Right. It, it is, it is, it is ridiculous. I mean, in, nowadays, I mean, I, I actually discourage. I've seen original um, bow and original creation albums going. Well, I don't know, probably one hundred and fifty dollars. I've seen it around one hundred and thirty pounds. It is it's ludicrous. Yeah. It is now. I understand collectors' market because I, I, I've been a record collector. I've, I've collected guitars. I've sold most of my collection now, but. Um, I understand the collected, but if it's the music that you're after, um, I mean, creation uh, creation has come out. It's been released. It's been re-released on vinyl twice, actually, uh, once for Spain and once in in Italy. But they're available all the way around around the world anyway. So yeah, yeah, yeah. The internet has helped out with that too. Oh yeah, very. Uh, the the, inter the internet has been the internet. Is, it's interesting. It's the old Pareto principle. It swapped things over when I was a kid. Incomes were sort of like 80% from record sales, 20% from gigs. Mm -hmm. That's how it worked out. Now, swap 20% from 20% from, from, from recorded work, 80% from gigs. So I lose out because I don't gig much. But it's from my point of view, I'm just a happy bunny if if people can get to hear the music. If right the way, right the way back from, from that, that Elgar experience in um, in Coventry. And it's it's always been the music, and this is this is again it's you know show business is called show business for a reason. There's two things to it: the show and there's business. And if you're good at show and rubbish at business, yeah, you'll end up in penury. If you're great at business and no good at show, you won't do much. But if you're brilliant at both, who can we say? Dylan, yeah. uh, Bowie, Paul Simon, McCartney. You know, you know these people; they're brilliant at both. And that's that's why they're they're doing what they're doing. But to me, it's always been the music. And then nobody nobody has ever said Cherry Red. I've done fourteen albums with Cherry Red, fourteen albums released through Cherry Red. Well, my new one is the, is the fourteen. Nobody has ever said to me, "I want you to do this. I'd like you to write that. Can you do the other?" And nobody has ever asked it. And I wouldn't want to work in that way anyway. It's the music's too important to me. Well, you know, speaking of Cherry Red, that that is my go-to label as far as finding out 
about a lot of these obscure bands. They release some great, you know, material. Oh, they there. do. You know, and and you know, compilation packages of a lot of these that are, you know, like that's how I discover a lot of artists. Yeah. From the compilation albums, you know. Oh yeah, they're, 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 they are tremendous. The funny thing is that I think. I, said, I, I, I do stand to be correct. If I think I am the only artist, because you know they're a reissue label, really. I think I'm the only artist that is actually putting out consistently new material with them. Mm -hmm. I think I am actually the only one, but yeah, they're happy maybe. with it. But I mean, they've, you know, they've, 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 they've been very generous and they've never... What happened? On one occasion, I've done a design for a, a sleeve they didn't like it because they thought it could be misinterpreted. I won't go into that, but they did, and they were probably right. So that had to be so that had to be done. And another one, I'd created a video, and I actually had a Nazi flag in it. Not I wasn't pushing Nazism. It was actually it was a thing called a Patriot, and uh, they said, mm, "Sorry." We can't, we really, really cannot have that. So I had to redo that with a, a German national flag. That's fine. But those are the only two times that CR have, have sort of flagged anything up. They've never said a thing about the music. They've never said, you know, mm, I think it's too long, too short. I think you should take that out. Could you do a remix of that? They've never said a darn thing. They've just supported me and I'm very grateful for it. See, see, see Trevor, your subversiveness is <laughs> again. <laughs> from the 1917 to the Nazi flag, see? Yeah, exactly that. <laughs> That's exactly. got to be reined in a little. It has to, it has to be. <laughs> and yeah, I never even thought about that, but but I, I mean, I just I just created the video. And um, and it's a good video, actually. It's a good video. If you, if you after this, if you, I'm really, you know, I'm really sorry, by the way. I, I, I would have liked to have played you a couple of tunes. That's fine. But, but the difficulty is, and I don't know why it is, I have tried, but Zoom, will not allow me. It, once I start playing the guitar, the whole sound breaks up. And I've tried recording, I've tried all sorts of tweaks, and it wouldn't work. But if, if you, just talking about that particular track, if you care to YouTube um, The Patriot, mm -hmm. um, it's, a nice, it's a nice video. But where you see the German flag come in, that originally was the Nazi flag, but we don't talk about that. <laughs> we won't go there. Um, talk a little bit about uh, the differences between uh, the music style of Bo and your alter ego, John Trevor. Um, John Trevor was <laughs> John Trevor was going to be was going more elect, not electronic particularly, but more electric. So we had uh, we had Sky Dance, we had Sky Dance, two versions of Sky Dance actually, one more rocky and one more electric folky. Both have now been released actually, uh, but John Trevor was really going to be more of that sort of um, electric uh, electric folk. Okay. Um, but it never got off the ground because, although funnily enough, as I say, I was the very first record to be released on Dandelion. I was also on the very last, but that's John Trevor, yeah. which was the very some fun going forward compilation. You know, Dandelion was so, I mean, it was so, so up to, I, on top of each other, I mean, they released a sampler as the very last, the very last album. I mean, you don't do that. You 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 do samplers to get people to buy albums. They come, no, no, the very last. They were just wrong way around. Anyway, by the by, um, yeah, John Trevor was going to be was going to be more electric. Um, now the funny thing was that I did during my sort of what I would call the interregnum when I, when I wasn't in any way involved with the music business. So we're talking from 72 through, like I said, to 95, not at all. But I always had the studio. And I always had basses, guitars, piano, synths, uh, drum, electric drums, I mean, a whole lot. So I did a lot of recording, which of stuff which you would say was really John Trevor yeah. in style. Yeah. The difficulty is that when Bo came up again, started out through Peel talking about it in that uh, Interzone magazine and then onwards. Oh, and I, I did, uh, would you believe, uh, Billboard Russia did a, did a full article. I don't know why, what, about Billboard Russia. Anyway, they did a full article on me uh, in Russian. I, I'm assuming it was complimentary. Um, but all of this sort of took up with Bo. So then 
some of these tracks, I, I did um, a, a CD with Angel Air, mm -hmm. uh, which came out in nine, no, 2009. And they wanted a whole bunch of stuff that had come out in this, what I've described, the Interregnum, when I was doing all these recordings, but they were just for me. Okay, fine. But the trouble was, I was Bo. So these tracks went out as Bo, even though they were not the folky Bo. Right. The, the folky type songs, but not done in that way. So there's some real heavy stuff. And it, it, CD went down all right. But unfortunately, John Trevor had to be sort of put to one side because John Trevor meant absolutely nothing. Whereas Bo, bless him, meant yeah. at least a little bit of something. So right. that's why they went out. But you had that. and that's happened again because I did a, I did um, an album for Cherry Red called Fables and Facades, which was just take it was purely these uh, songs from that period, real real retro, real heritage stuff, and went, went down all right, so fine. So um, on these very odd occasions, Bo produces something that is outside of the Brooklyn Twelfth Street. Right. Well, you had you had that name recognition with Bo. That's that's the that's the point. If John Trevor had been, yeah, uh, if John Trevor had, had sort of had more exposure, then right. that might have meant a change. But as I said, the, Bo is a difficulty with America because there's just so many. It, it it's such a shame over here. I, 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 truthful, truthfully, you you you'd have to go through a hundred thousand people to find another <laughs> over there for every hundred. Right. 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 Well, uh, talk talk a little bit about the roses of Eam. Is it Eam? Oh, Eam. 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 It rhymes with Eam. 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 That has to be one of the most gorgeous folk songs I've ever heard. Oh, thank you. And I gather a lot of fans, you know, feel that sentiment. As well. Yeah. Um, yeah. I would. As I said I don't. I don't do much. I don't do much gigging. I, I really didn't. Um, even even in in the well, I wrote him mid seventies, yeah, early to mid seventies. Anyway, I was living I was living in Sheffield, you know, very close to Sheffield at the time, a little place called Dronfield, and uh, I was just actually as John Trevor, not as Bo. I was just doing a few folk gigs in in a few local folk clubs. Now I was in this club called the White Swan, and um, Roy Bailey was topping the bill. And uh, Roy was in the in the audience, and I did Eam, did Rose of Eam. Eam is very, very close to Dronfield, where we were, very close to Sheffield, in North Derbyshire. And for those people who don't know, the, the story is in, in uh, 1665, when the, the, the Great Plague was taking place in London, um, an infected batch of cloth um, was taken from London to this very unfortunate small village in Derbyshire called Eam. And um, the upshot of it was that the vast majority of the, the village was wiped out because the, the, court, the, the first person to get it was the tailor, um, George Vickers. And then after that, the rest of the, uh, of the population got it and got the plague and died. But the heroic thing is that they built a low wall literally around the village. And they um, actually, it wasn't 100% secure, but it was as near as damn it. Um, and they said they would not go outside and the food was brought in and they paid for food, but the food was all, sorry, the money was all disinfected. Um, and out of 350 people, only 30 had survived. And so that's the story of the roses, the roses of England. The reason for roses is because when you get the, uh, the plague, um, first of all, there is a scent of roses. People think it's because you had bunches of roses that stop the smell, it wasn't. You tend to have a, a, a smell in your nose that smells like roses. Okay. And so that's why it's called Roses of Eam. Then anyway, I wrote this song, played it at the White Swan. Roy Bailey was there and Bailey said, hmm, I like that. Do you mind if I sing it? So I said, no, not at all. So I said, I'll, I'll do you a, I did a cassette tape. Send it to him and, um, and then, oh, well, it must've been three or four years later. And uh, it came out on his Hard Times LP. Great LP, actually, but it's, it's all of um, what I would say, uh, social, uh, so, uh, socially responsible sounds, it sounds a bit ch churlish, um, socially aware songs. Um, but anyway, he, that, that album, Roy's album, sold very well. 
Um, and then he brought it, it became very popular. And he sang it. I mean, Roy did a lot of work all around the world. He, he worked in the States to a degree, a lot in Canada, a lot in Australia. Um, and it became very well known at folk festivals. And then it started getting sung quite a lot. And he put it on, he brought out a, an, another CD called Past Masters, and he included it on that. That sold well. And then a Canadian band called Soft Focus, they took it up. That sold well. And now quite a quite a few <laughs> quite a few people have done it on YouTube with varying degrees of success. <laughs> but I'll tell you one thing, during lockdown, um, Jim Milne my good friend from Tractor, um, Jim was doing, he, he did a hundred days of a hundred of his favorite songs, they were a different song each day and he put it on uh, Facebook, not on YouTube, on Facebook. And one of them, he did he did Roses of Beam and he did a really nice version of it. So mm -hmm. uh, just, it was just Jim and an acoustic guitar. Yeah. But, uh, but then since then, my, my original version, the one from 74, uh, that has now come out on, <laughs> it came out, it was part of an album called 12 Strings to the Bow. Get the pun? You see, see what I did there? Yeah. <laughs> 12 Strings to the Bow. And uh, this, this, this album never came out. Um, and I, I had the masters and that was it. It came out on vinyl in 2012. Uh -huh. And that's, that is, that, that's fine. I mean, we, the, 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 record, the record is now out there. Um, but funnily enough, it had never, I'm going to tell you something now that literally nobody knows. Um, when did, hey, tell me, when does this go out? This will go out, usually it takes me about a week. Oh, fine. Edit. I, I can bear that. No, what, what happened was, uh, literally this happened last week. Mm -hmm. I think last week. Um, Cherry Red got in touch with me and said, We've noticed there's a couple of albums that you have done that we haven't made available digitally. Yeah, and then, so we've got 12 Strings to the Bow, which was only, I only ever licensed that for vinyl to a, a label called Salvation. And there's also uh, Edge of the Dark, which was uh, the album that the CD that I put out on Angel Air, that was 2009. Again, I only licensed it to, because I, I have the, the rights to these. I only licensed that for, um, for CD. So I said, yeah, that's right. So they said, well, we'd be interested in putting these out digitally. All right, fine. So we talked about it and, you know, a day and a half later, we've sort of got an agreement. So the bottom line is these two albums, 12 Strings to the Bow, which does contain the Roses of Eden, the original 1974 version, and Edge of the Dark from 2009, are going to be coming out on, and I literally got it confirmed yesterday morning, um, 31st of March on uh, on Cherry, Cherry Red di uh, uh, digital streaming and the whole shebang. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. So that's coming. Out. But, but yeah, just so I'm just I'm just gonna gonna go back. Roses of uh -huh. Eden. Um, every all the success of that is down to Roy Bailey. I mean, Roy Roy made it well known. But nevertheless, my own version of it now has come out in several different ways. Be that on, well, it's going to be now digital. Um, it's on a. a Oh, uh, cold, uh, cold, 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 kind of. Name. Um, oh, can't remember the name of the label. But there's a, a beautiful compilation um, yeah. that, that's, uh, that, that that's come that out. May be the one, that may be the one that I picked up. That's where I got, it was a compilation. What's the label? And it's, um, I can't remember. Most of the tracks are from new artists. Yeah. But, but yours was one of the only ones. Yeah, yeah, real, real old thing. But they, they did a good job with it. I'm sorry, yeah. a bit garbled. They did a good job with it. It's come out already, as I say, on 12 strings to the bow. It's now coming out on, on digital, so people will be able to get hold of it. That's the, that is the original one from 90, uh, 1974. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's where I picked it up first. Well, um, talk about 1994, 95, when they're... Uh, came a resurgence of interest in Bow. Mm. What was one of the first uh, contacts that you, that somebody made to you uh, to let you know that there was an, uh, a resurgence? It was Clive. Clive, Clive Selwood, because they, what happened was they'd licensed uh, my stuff mm. 
I don't know whether that was the first one, I can't remember, uh, but to a uh, label called C for Miles. Mm -hmm. and they, they were bringing it out and they'd, they'd had the tapes digitally remastered and uh, they were bringing that out on, uh, on C for Miles. And that was when the whole thing really just started to move. And then, I mean, various other things happened. The, uh, that infamous sampler, there's some fun going forward, the very last, uh, the very last release from Dandelion, that was released. Then C for Miles did another sampler, that one I was talking about, which had time on it. And then eventually, um, after John died, then Shirley and Clive decided that the time was coming, Clive was retiring. And so they sold the whole catalogue to mm -hmm. Cherry Red. And I say the whole catalogue, not strictly true. Uh, one act, which was Tractor, uh, the, the, the guy who, had worked with Tractor quite a bit, Chris Hewitt. He actually um, he bought the Tractor contract from uh, from Dandelion before the, the move to Cherry Red. So they weren't involved in the move to Cherry Red, but all the rest of us were. Bridget was, Siren were, Gene Vincent was. You know, and all that. so we all went to Cherry. We all then went to Cherry Red. And my relationship with Cherry Red has sort of just gone from there. You know. Yeah, yeah, it's just kind of steamrolled. Oh yeah, yeah, and it's 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 been a, it's been a good working relationship. But as you've said, I mean, the internet helps so much because I mean, even now, you know, when I've done an album in this room, when it's all been, when this, you wouldn't believe what this looks like when it's when it's turned into a studio. Um, but of course, I don't even have to send a CD to them now. You just send the WAVs and everything else. It's it, the whole thing. The, the internet has made such a massive difference. Right, right. And see, you're one of those that can see uh, technology, how much it has changed over the years. Yeah. And uh, from back when you first started playing and recording. Oh. Yeah, it's just like, wow, leaps and bounds. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, I think, I think I'm, I'm, I'm quite fortunate in that, well, as I said right at the start of all this, I mean, maths, quite interesting, mathematics. And there is a lot in computing. It, that, it, that if, you, if you look at it from a mathematical point of view, it's quite, quite common sense. And I'm not saying I'm a great computer whiz, I'm not, but I'm, I'm reasonably au fair, I'm quite computer literate. And, and having a sort of a, a slightly mathematical mindset, it helps. Right. And so consequently, I can do you know, my own digital recording, I can do my own digital mixing, I can, I can, I can build a computer actually, but I mean, that's, I don't bother doing that. <laughs> I did that years ago. <laughs> we'll talk a little bit about Symphonica then, another alter ego. Yeah, um, again, just referring back to creation, I said that Symphonica is really a, it, it is very, it is niche, best word to use. My idea with Symphonica was to create symphonic electronics. That's what it's about. Symphonic, electronica, split the word and you've got Symphonica. With an F in the middle, not a PH. Um, and I, 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 I create sounds which I, in some cases, then underpin with um, with a, a kind of constant rhythm. It's 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 a bit. Weird. These these tracks are about fifteen minutes each. So I mean, a full CD is only about four tracks. But I've also, um, well, a couple of them have come out on different labels. But I've also released some stuff. On my own, you know, to be honest, I did a, I did an album called, and um, it is an album called um, Letters in Time. Sit, sit here. Oh. <clears throat> Letters in Time. There we go. Now, the thing about this is that. This is not a CD, it's a DVD. And I, I sort of created this as a, um, an audio visual experience, which sounds really highfalutin, but it, it, the, the tracks, the, the letters refer to different people who have written very famous letters and the, the tracks are created around their letters. So if I'm just going through this, for example, there's one called Jacques, which is, let's say, reflects on the Emile Zola opened at the President of France in 1898. That was the Dreyfus affair. I don't know. Dreyfus, uh, don't worry. 
Dreyfus affair. Um, from a Birmingham jail, that was Martin Luther King's letter of 1963, uh, a soldier's declaration, Siegfried Soon's 1917 anti-war statement that later was printed in the Times, and De Profundis, which was Oscar Wilde's 87, 1887 letter to the Lord Alfred Douglas from Reading Jail. Now, these, these are quite big pieces that have been created for ele electronically, but then I also created videos, which I made into a DVD, which is this particular thing that I just showed you. The difficulty was that when I tried putting that to anybody, the word that came back was, you've got to be joking, because there is absolutely no sale for that sort of thing. Anyway, one chap, uh, German label, came back and, he, and he, he, he watched the whole thing, and he said, this is brilliant. He said, this is wonderful. You've put a lot of work into this. I'm not going to release it because there's absolutely no way, Jose. So I actually, I did this, I created my own little label to do this. So I, I released this. Um, and also another, another Symphonica one as well. But I mean, there is, it's unfortunate, but there is, there is no, there's no sale. There's no sale for this sort of thing at all. And it is, when I say it's niche, I'm not being sort of falsely modest. It is genuinely very, very niche. Yeah. Well, have you, what kind of uh, reaction have you, have you received? Uh, from any, people, from yeah, people from, who like it, from people who like it, they yeah. love it. From yeah. people, from people who, who, who've heard it and can't stand it. It's mm -hmm. not like Bo. I mean, Bo, there's no, there's no real, unless you are particularly prejudiced, there's no real reason to dislike Bo. There's every reason to dislike this if you don't like it. But I mean, I, I got a lovely email from a chap um, it wasn't this album, actually, it was um, one called Song of Some of the Volcanoes, the first one. And he said he was sitting on a balcony in Spain and he was listening to this on headphones and he, said, and he was looking out over some lagoon or something. And he was saying, this is the most, this is the most, the most dreamy experience I've ever had. Thank you for doing it. And it's nice when you get that, that, sort, of, that sort of reaction. Um, but, I mean, not everybody likes it and I accept it is, yeah, I've used the word niche, I'll stick with that because I say I want to be kind to myself. I like it, and I can if, if I'm in a bit of a bad mood, I can actually put this on, put it on this screen here and just watch it. Now I'm a happy bunny, but not everybody does. Yeah, it's not everybody's cup of tea. Yeah, no, no, no. no. Um, now we get to the part of the, the conversation that the really the meat of the conversation, what I wanted to talk about. When did you first attend the uh, Falls Nationals guitar show in Arlington? Oh. That would be, let me think, uh, mid eighties. Yeah, mid eighties. I think that was a, that was the first time. Uh, but I'd, I've been, I think, four times. It might be five. But I, I mean, I've been to guitar shows in uh, Orlando. But I mean, the Falls National. I mean, that was always the that was always the big one. Last time we were there, I mean, it was it had gone through. It was it was three full halls. That was that, that was unbelievable. But we, I mean, we always, we, we stayed in Arlington, used to eat a lot at the, I don't know if you're still going, the Cattleman's in uh, Fort Worth? Yes. Yeah. The Cattleman's restaurant, we used to, oh, I'm not, I'm not a great steak eater, but my wife, I mean, she, she, she prefers the cow still to be walking, you know. <laughs> right. But they, but yeah, we used to go to the Cattleman's a lot when we were, when we were staying in Dallas, in uh, Arlington. Yeah, yeah. How many, how many years did you uh, go to that? I, I think, uh, over over a period of about eight or eight or nine years, we didn't go every year. So about every two years, for okay. I mean, it must be four times. It, it's certainly four. It could be five. I can't remember. Okay, okay. And it was just at the Arlington Convention Center. Yeah, 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 yeah. But when we when we first went, I mean, it was big then by our standards. It was immense, but it was big. Um, but it was just one hall. But then I think either the second time or the third, it had gone into two full halls. And then the last time it had gone to three. I mean, this it, it was not brilliant, utterly, utterly brilliant. But uh, yeah, I've, I've I've got to the the age stroke stage now where I have I have to sell them. You see, um, I've got it, it. It's not that I run out of room, but it's one of those things that you begin to think. Well, you know, when you get into your mid seventies, hmm, what are you going to do with this? You know, so I've had to. I've I've unloaded. Oh, well over thirty. Uh -huh. That's so I haven't got that many left now. <laughs> That's a lot. Well, you know, it's interesting to see, you know, of course, I have an interest in the music. And that's why I reach out to you, you musicians and artists. But then there's also 
on a lot of these interviews a connection between you know either texas or like here in your case arlington you know that uh i think draws your interest no yeah. it draws the interest of the interviewee too i mean you've got to you've got to remember i mean all of my <laughs> She sounds stupid for a Yorkshireman, but all of my musical heritage is American. Mm -hmm. I'm not American. I don't have any American relatives, but musically, I mean, you can talk about Elvis. You can talk about Lead Belly. I mean, I've been to Lead Belly's grave in Mooring Sport, Louisiana, and uh, uh, I've been to Scott Joplin's grave. And uh, uh, I mean, I mean, to Billy the Kids as welcome to that, but he wasn't a musician. But, but I mean, so many of these um, uh, of these influences on me have been have been American, and and that obviously includes it includes Texas. We spent a lot of time in Texas. We've been down. We we had one of mm, oh story, okay. but one time we uh, we we took a car. We, we were staying in Dallas, and we were going to spend some time in the Chisos Mountains down the uh, Big Bend National yeah. Park. Yeah. yeah. So we went down there and driving it, it was a, it's a Ford Taurus, Ford Taurus. There's a, there's a relevance to that, I'll come to it. We're going up down these mountain mountains and all of a sudden the engine cuts out. Really nasty because obviously everything, steering, braking, everything is power. So I'm, we're going down this steep hill and I'm heavy on the brake as I can be going manual and lugging this the steering wheel around. And I managed to bring it on, on quite a steep curve. I managed to bring it to a halt. Mm. Lovely guy pulls up. Yeah, I mean, he, he was, a, again, I won't attempt, attempt the accent. He was a Texan. He said, yeah, you've got the, you've got the Stetson. So I knew it was a Texan, you know. Had to, and he said, you're having trouble. So I said, yeah, the um, car's conked out. And I said, well, a couple of miles to go to this, this lodge where we're staying. The guy was mortified. I mean, I think if it had been a Japanese car, he would have said, oh, no problem, you know, <laughs> what do you expect? Ah, oh, it was an American car. He said, yeah. oh, no, I'm so sorry, you know, the, the American car has let you down. So let me give you a lift. So he, he, he gave us a lift down to the little lodge where we were staying. And that was, that was great. He was a lovely, lovely chap. And, and we were very grateful to him. So I got onto, um, it was, I got onto the, the garage in Odessa and said, look, you know, this Ford Taurus, American Ford Taurus has let me down. Um, can you can you sort of come and get it and bring me a replacement car? So the guy said, yeah, yeah, where, where are you? So I said, we're in the cheese sauce mountains. He says, where's the cheese sauce mountains? I said, not, <laughs> not cheese sauce. <laughs> Big Ben National Park. <laughs> so he turned up about three in the morning, to be fair. But oh, yeah. that's, that's the only time a car let us down. It was a Ford Taurus. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. No, I don't mean to rub it in, Greg. I'm sorry. <laughs> American car lets you do yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They they do that sometimes. <laughs> yes, I'm sure. I'm sure Japanese do as well. <laughs> right, right. They're uh, not as expensive to, to fix when they do. The no, American. no, uh, I know. <laughs> but we spend we we've, we've actually spent a lot of a lot of time in Texas over. Over the years, a, a lot of it because of the of the guitar show, actually. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, switching gears to your uh, your new album, Kingdom of the Blind. Uh, oh yeah, coming, yeah. Out, coming out in April. Uh, yeah, with the, we're talking now, twenty first of April, twenty first of April, and within we're getting towards the the, the so sort the of very end of all the arrangements right now, but uh, I'm very hopeful. It's good. It's a, it's a good album. I mean, I'm I'm very happy with it. But see, think about my style. I try, I am, because I'm what you can, I suppose, categorize a topical folk singer. I try not to sing, I try not to sing too much about specific events because quite honestly, if you do that, they've got such a short shelf life. Obviously a piece of news goes out of the news and all of a sudden people are saying, what's that about? But if you look behind news and news items and incidents, you can always find that there are themes that actually have a much, much broader application. Right. And so consequently, I mean, also the songs that, that, I, um, that I've written that I write for this album and that I've written for other albums, they're, they're, they're inspired by rather than written about. Mm -hmm. And this one is no, is, no, is no exception. So we have stuff that's about, oh, wokeism, uh, Ukraine, um, 
Oh, I mean, there's, there's, there's so many things that have inspired the, the songs on this album, but hopefully um, people aren't going to listen to it and think mm, that's going to be dead in the water in six months. It is the themes rather than the incidents that are important. Right, right. I get that. Yeah. But this comes out, yeah, 20, uh, 21st of April, um, all over the world, actually. So anybody who's on Amazon or iTunes, feel free. Dip in. Okay. okay. Well, unfortunately, we don't have time to go over all of your. No. Movies, but uh, would you like to highlight or uh, plug some of those that you're most proud of? Do you know, to be honest, I, 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 it, it, it's a question that's been asked me. With, I know it, it's glib to say it. You know, which is your favorite album? And the answer is always the next one. And that, it's not meant to be glib, but you know, once once something is new and it's underway and you're planning something else, you're always thinking, hoping that it's going to be better than the last. So I mean, I'm I am I would never release an album, I would never release a track that I wasn't happy with. And I'm I'm delighted to say that there's one particular reviewer who's He's been very kind to me over time, actually. He's made the point. I've never released a filler. I've never released, a, not just an album, I've never released a track that's a filler. If you don't like it, that's fine, but it's not a filler. And so consequently, I'm, I'm very proud of all of my work. But I mean, the last two or three albums, I've, I mean, recently I've been doing sort of one a year. Um, and it's, it, it keeps me off the streets. Let's put it that way. It keeps, <laughs> It keeps me. It keeps me grounded. It gives me something to do in this room, you see. <laughs> and during lockdown, this room was absolutely invaluable. I tell you. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I can, yeah. You're right. You're right about that. Well, uh, that's another thing about lockdown. It was kind of like a blessing in disguise, I think, for a lot of musicians uh, and writers. Yeah. yeah. Oh, but yes. You were like you were like forced, you know, into that kind of situation. Yeah. If you were a writer, it was ideal. If you're a performer, it was hell on earth. So I was doing, I did a radio interview with um, uh, a, 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 a chap who was playing some of my music and we we're talking. And he was saying, you know, has it, has it uh, largely affected you? I said, no, it hasn't. Because, because I don't go out and gig, I don't make, if, if someone is releasing a new record, they want me to, then yeah, I'll go out and gig, because it's fair, it's fair. But it's not something that I, I do as a matter of, of general course. Uh, so from my point of view, it didn't really make any great, any great difference, but it did mean that I could certainly concentrate on writing and recording. And I say it myself, but I think I produced some pretty good work during that time, certainly the reviews and, right. and the sales as well to a reasonable degree, but the reviews certainly were very positive, so I can't complain. But I lockdown was cruel to a lot of people and for performers. Sure. Um, oh, sure, yeah, yeah. Well, like you said, with the advent of the... Uh recording your own self-recording studios that are on your computer those apps and stuff you know which is oh that's a, it, yeah it's a, it's, a, it's a boon it's a it's a blessing and what you can what you can do now and i would you know i would say to any anybody any any aspiring musician i mean you don't normally have to tell kids too much because they know what computing is all about but you know your 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 bedroom is your studio and you can produce some really good stuff right right well, with all of the uh, album releases, especially of the, of the Bow material, uh, is your backlog pretty well used up, or are there still some unreleased tracks in the vault? Loads unreleased. Okay. Even going even going back to the, as you said, the, the word I've used, the interregnum, that time between 72 and 95, I mean, the amount of stuff that I recorded over that period. Uh, I don't say I wouldn't say hundreds of tracks, but there were very, very many, yeah. and a lot has ne a lot has never seen light of day. Probably won't, to be honest. But I mean, that's just background. But, but I write all the time because I've done I've, I've done this since I was sixteen. I just do it. I mean, the, the, if you if you are, I, I'm not saying I sit down every day and I write a song every day. I don't. But if something comes up, if a a phrase comes up, or a um, an idea or something that sparks my imagination. If it just comes up, I make a jotting, I just yeah. jot it down. And then I actually have a, a file on the computer, literally just little, little notes. And come the time when I'm not say recording and I've got some time and I'm not recording and mixing, I come back to the, ah, right, yes. And I just write. 
it's 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 very therapeutic, Jay, actually. Yeah, yeah, I, I imagine so. You know, uh, is there a certain time of the day that uh, there's inspiration comes to you more than others, or uh, is it just any time? Do you know, that's a funny thing you should ask. I, I, I mean, not, not really. I write a lot at any time, mm-hmm. but after midnight, okay. I get some very good refining ideas. Not necessarily original ideas for original songs, but if I've if I've got a song or songs underway, they can they, after midnight there can be a lot of refining goes on, and and some reason. Things come to things come to me in the bathroom as well. That's weird. They really do. If I if, if I'm cleaning my teeth or something like that, and this is one of those aggravating things, you get an idea. You think I've got to remember this. You know, brush, brush, brush. I've got to remember this. Brush, brush, brush. <laughs> right, and right. you sort of rush in here actually with a piece of paper and just start writing. Just get it written down, and then at least it hasn't gone. But when I'm in the bathroom, that tends to that tends to be a, a bit of a catalyst. You know? <laughs> well, I'm going through, uh, I guess as, as we get older too, I'm going through, speaking of the bathroom, I'll walk into a room <laughs> and then say, why did I walk into this room for? Uh, Are you not, this? <laughs> I'm not quite in that, posi- in that position yet, but I do, and it is, it is I, yeah. what I hate is being in a position where um, an idea or something comes to me and I've got to concentrate, concentrate, concentrate to hold to hold it in mind. I have been in a situation where um, I've been, say, on a bus or on a journey or something like that, and an idea has come and I haven't had the facility to write it down. I've actually rung home and, and left the message on my answering machine. That's exactly what it was, just so at least I can remember it. Yeah. I would hate to lose. If it, if it becomes a good idea, I'd hate well, to lose it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, it, would, it would be sad for that to... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, what... Not that you have probably have a lot of time for it, but uh, do you have any interest outside of music? Um, I'm, I mean, yes, I'm. I'm very interested in politics, and I always have been since I was since I was a, a, a little nipper. I'm very interested in politics. I like driving. I've enjoyed a lot of travel over time. I mean, I can't remember in the states. I think we've I think we've been to forty three out of the fifty states. So we've done a lot of traveling in America. More, more um, than me. Sorry, I said more, oh, yeah, than, I more than a lot of as, as I've talked to Americans, more than a lot of Americans actually. Um, we've done a lot of traveling over time, but to be honest, and this isn't an age thing. Oh, the last time the last time we went abroad was 2012. We went to Hawaii. Um, I've been to Hawaii three or four times. Um, I cannot bear airports now. It, I mean, I remember I remember the days. Halcyon days when I remember in Dallas, um, we went, I wanted to go down to the Johnson Space Center in Houston. So we, we were in staying in a hotel in Dallas. We toddled out to Love Field in the car, got on a, a, um, um, a Southwest Airlines, Southwest Airlines, just, just went through, got on, flew down to Houston, went to the Johnson Space Center, flew back, big deal, that was it, back in, uh, back in Dallas for a meal in the evening. Terrific. Now, you're waiting three hours before you get anywhere near. You have to, have to take your shoes off before you're going, oh, God. And so and the last trip to Hawaii, just, just put the kibosh on it for me. And I just thought, I just cannot be bothered anymore with airports. I mean, OK, you're talking about jet lag as well in those cases, but it just got too much. And it's not got any better over time. No, after, after 9-11, um, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's just been, it's a beating. That's what. That's what me and my brother are a phrase that we use, you know, too many of those trips, you just the beat down. It's just yeah, it is. before we, you even take the trip. Yeah. 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 I mean, we were we were in we were in Vegas a few years ago and I wanted to meet up with a friend in in, in Burbank down. I don't gamble. Yeah. I'm, I don't gamble, but I love Las Vegas anyway. But we um we wanted to meet up with a friend in Burbank. So we just Went off to to McCarran, got the got the plane down to down to Burbank. No problem. Met up with our friends, had a nice dinner with them. Back to Las Vegas. No problem. Actually, I should tell you, when that occasion when we went to uh, went to McCarran Airport in Las Vegas, uh, who was in front of us in the in the cube at Chuck Berry. So there you are. Really, really. Yeah, yeah. Complete with his guitar, which he just checked in. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> yeah, anyway, sorry, I'm out of the language. But I mean, those were the days where you could, where travel was 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 easy. But right. it's got to the point now where I just can not be bothered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I feel you there. I feel you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think we've kind of come to a. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long session. I hope I haven't gone too much because I do. No, 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 not at all. And, um, you know, a lot of these interviews end up being a couple of hours, which looks like this one is. I'm going to edit some of it, so maybe it won't be quite as long. Sure. But uh, that's what I think a lot of people are used to these 20, 30 minute short interviews, you know. Yeah. Um, and of course, you got that short attention span that's worldwide anyway, sure. most people. But um, I think if you really want to find out more about an artist, you know, really kind of get in deep sometimes. I, I don't want to say deep, but no, no, a little, little, little bit more than just the surface. Bit of depth. And you've got to spend some time, you know. Yeah, uh, I agree. I'm, 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 honestly, I'm very grateful for the opportunity. It's been lovely to talk. It's been nice to, nice to have a conversation. Now, I'm yeah. sorry you had to get up. You haven't got up too early, have you? No, 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 no. It's uh, 1 o'clock p.m. right now, or a little right. after. Yeah. No, we're, ten, we're, we're uh, 10 past seven in the evening. So. Yep. so we got the six hours. Yeah, that's one thing, too, I got to look at because I know our our time changes in March. I think yours is like either, I don't think it's the same weekend, but I think it's the following weekend. Yeah, it could be. I think I, I, I've got a feeling it's 31st of March, but I'm probably wrong. It's around that time. Yeah, so I got it looking for future uh, interviews around that time. I got to make sure and coordinate with the time difference. Yeah. But I will, I will definitely let you know an email. Yeah, do, you. yeah, do. And uh, there'll be, there'll, if you're interested, there'll be a. I know that there will be a, vid, a video coming out for the new album. One of the tracks um, is going to have a video made for it. If you're interested, I can, I can give you a link to that when it comes up, and then you can see what you think. Yeah, I definitely would like to see that. Definitely like to check that out. All right. Well, Trevor, uh, thank you again uh, for the Pleasure. time and, and for sharing so much. Uh, appreciate it. And, thank you. Uh, thank, no, seriously, thank you very much for your time, and, and I, I really do appreciate it. It's been, it's been a fun thing to do. Well, it's it's nice to be appreciated, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll be in touch. Okay. Thanks, Greg. Take care of yourself. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>